This is episode number 26 of the Expert Table Tennis podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and my guest on the show today is Brett Clark. Now, Brett is one half of TT Edge, the online coaching system, uh, which was started a few years back by Australian player and coach William Hensel. Brett's well known for creating these really crazy YouTube videos. There's probably a good chance that you've already seen them. If you haven't, you need to get onto YouTube and check them out because they're hilarious. But at the same time, they're also full of really great information. So he creates these just awesome videos. He's well known for being a fantastic server, so I thought I'd get him on the show today and find out how we can all become strong servers because obviously the serve is such an important part of the game. If you can crack that, you're going to be well on your way to becoming a top player. That's all from me. Let's get straight into the interview with Brett Clark. My guest on the show today is TT Edge coach Brett Clark. Hi, Brett. Hey, Ben. How are you? Yeah, great. Thank you. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, you're you're currently out in the Philippines, aren't you? Kind of travelling around. Yeah, that's right. Staying in the Philippines for a few months, so uh, so yeah, and here, nice and hot. So basically, you're you're from Australia, and you used to you used to play in the national team, and at one stage you coached the national team. Now you're kind of travelling around different places in in is it the South Pacific? Um, yep, the Pacific in general. And that's not for table tennis. That's just for pleasure. Sometimes it's for table tennis, sometimes it's for pleasure, like coming to the Philippines is entirely for pleasure, but um, from time to time I'm doing um, some projects for the ITTF where I go to various island nations in the Pacific and do some coaching and development there for them. Great, so it sounds like you've got a pretty cool life, you're able to just move around, visit different places, do you do kind of the majority of your work online and just from a laptop? Um, with uh, with TT Edge, uh, my business TT Edge, of course, it's all online. But um, the development work I do in the Pacific is very hands-on. It's going to schools and working with locals, trying to build the sport up there. So it can be online or it can be hands-on, depending on what sort of project I'm doing at the time. Okay, so so it's a nice mix between still doing some some coaching in person and then at the same time doing all of the TTH stuff online. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I enjoy both. I, I enjoy working with, you know, kids out in the Pacific and so on, but I also enjoy just, you know, getting online and making some videos and so on. So it's, it, it suits me. The lifestyle I'm living suits me. I mean, everything always sounds a little bit better than what it is, of course, but yeah, it, it is enjoyable. TTH Edge has been going for quite a few years now, hasn't it? It was started by William Hensel. Do you know when he kind of kicked all, the, all of that off? William came up with the concept in about 2010, and it was probably sometime in around 2011 or 2012 where he really got the ball rolling with TT Edge. So, yeah, probably three or four years ago, it really took off. And when did he get you on board? He got me on board about a year ago, or maybe a little over a year ago. Okay. And then how, how does that work? What's your... What's your role now in TT Edge? Because I assume you and Will aren't together that much. No, we're not. Um, occasionally, I'll go to Melbourne and do some filming with him. But because I'm traveling around, I, I probably do most of the work now. You know, I make most of the videos. I communicate with the members and so on. So William's definitely taken a backseat role now. He's, he's studying. He's doing an MBA. And he's also working for a law firm. So he's extremely busy. So I do most of the work now. Okay, so it's kind of like he's he's almost handed it over and given you free reign to to kind of create what you want with it. Yeah, to an extent, to an extent. I mean, he will be back and he will do some things from time to time. But at the moment, he's he yeah, he's his life's just gone the totally different direction. So it's 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 definitely my baby now. Yeah. Cool, and it looks like you're doing a fantastic job. I've really enjoyed all of your. Um, videos you've been sticking up on YouTube and you take quite an interesting approach to coaching which I think is is really fresh when there's you know there's a lot of people producing videos now or or getting into it but generally it's just kind of step by step going through in quite a technical way and you you manage to add some humor and and fun to it and use a lot of illustrations and and different things to demonstrate what you want to get across is is that something that you've always had in your coaching is that a is that a nice way of calling me crazy or 
<laughs> well, I, I see that like on on some forums people kind of call you the crazy table tennis coach I don't know if that was that the kind of the image you were trying to create for yourself yeah definitely I, I think if you add some fun or you know you you act a little bit people people tend to remember it uh, remember it more rather than just basically oh this is how you play a forehand if you can add a story or it, you can make a few people laugh or even a few people hate you I think that it sort of sticks in their mind, you know, the, the messages you're trying to get across stick in their mind for years. As I said, even if they don't like it, they'll still remember it sort of thing. So, yeah, that, that, that's definitely the effect we were going for there. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I mean, my, my wife is not into table tennis at all. And usually if I'm watching table tennis videos, she'll be um, trying to, to move to a different room. But I've showed her a couple of your videos just because they made me laugh. And she, she thought they were really great. So, I mean, if... <laughs> If you're able to create videos that people that have no interest in table tennis are happy to sit and watch for a few minutes, and I think you're definitely doing something right. Well, you know, maybe they just want to see someone be going nuts. But yeah, I mean, look, I mean, sometimes it's a little bit embarrassing, and people get online and call you, call you some names and so on. But it's all part of it. I mean, you polarise people. You you expect to cop a little bit of criticism, but you know, a lot of positive feedback as well. People sort of laugh or you know, sort of take some of the tips on board and yeah it's all worth it in the end brilliant now you were i'm looking back at your kind of like history as a player so, you played for the australian team for about 15 years is so, that yeah. is that correct is that tell us how you started playing table tennis and and how you managed to break into the national team well that's a long story so i started when i was perhaps 10 years of age, but not, not in any serious way, sort of just with a hard bat playing, playing at home with my brother, my father. So that went on for probably a year or two and then joined the local competition. But again, not serious, or I wasn't very good at it. And, it, you know, it took a little while before I found serious junior comp- competition table tennis. So maybe when I was 13 or 14, I started entering tournaments and losing first round in every tournament. But I just really enjoyed it, so I took it a lot more seriously, found places to practice. And by the time I was 16 or 17, I was pretty much training full-time. Uh, school school was not very important to me, so I was practicing more than I should have been. And um, by the time I was 19 or so, I was in the Australian men's team. So it's to cut a long story short, obviously, but um, I wasn't a great junior, um, and I just worked hard to make the Australian senior team at a fairly young age and um, that's that's basically it. So what was the standard like in Australia at the time because I mean it seems like for quite a few years now it's been William Hensel was the number one and then there's quite a big drop down was yeah. there was there a group of players around when you, when you were playing professionally or, or were you maybe the the William Hensel who was kind of out on his own? No definitely I wasn't the William Hensel. Um, there were probably seven or eight players about my level, which was somewhere between two and 300 in the world standard. Okay. And we were quite even. You know, there was no standout players. We'd taken in turns of winning. And that was good because, I mean, when William come along, he sort of, he was a step ahead of the other players and, you know, other players struggled to develop around him and so on. But uh, at, during my time, the standard was very even. And, you know, when we played internationally, we were all sort of ranked very close to each other, even on the world rankings. And I think it was, I think it was good for Australian table tennis at the time. Not that William, William's been unbelievable for Australian table tennis. But, you know, within Australia, there hasn't been, like, fierce competition because he's been head and shoulders above the other players for so long now. Yeah. Mm. So what was your what was your highest world ranking, Brett? I'm guessing 220, 222 rings a bell, but I, I, I didn't write it down. I don't have it anywhere, but it was something like that, and that was in the that was in the 90s. Okay, well that that's pretty decent though. And you and you say that there was quite a lot of players around that level at the same time. Was um I know Jeff Plum from Ping Skills is is he that era as well? He was. He, he was. He made the Sydney Olympics team. He was my doubles partner uh, for the Sydney Olympics. That, okay. that would have been one of the only times he played for Australia. He was thereabouts. He was always sort of four, five, six uh, thereabouts, a strong player, but he wasn't in the team for any sort of substantial period of time. But as I said, very good player. All right. And um, what what was the highlight of your career? I know you, you had quite a long career. Did you get like any particularly um, great wins against top well-known players? 
highlights of my career, definitely being Australian singles champion, Australian doubles champion, with Jeff Plum actually, um, at least one of those times in doubles. I won the silver medal at the Commonwealth Games in mixed doubles in Manchester 2002. And okay. I beat a couple of top 70 players. I don't think I'll mention their names and embarrass them, but um, I've beaten a couple of top 70 players at reasonably big tournaments and so on over the years. So that's probably it. representing Australia at the Olympics as well. Uh, I'd definitely put in there. Sure, sure. And um, and during that time, I think were you coaching alongside the playing? Were you able to to oh. make a living playing professionally? How did it work? Because I mean, it, being in Australia makes it a bit more difficult doesn't it because you're not able to just kind of players from England can quickly nip over to Germany and play in the professional leagues but Australia is kind of a bit out there on its own yeah absolutely so I started coaching pretty much full-time about from the age of about 19 which is incredibly young and in a way a sellout um, you know from my own practice I stopped I basically stopped training when I was 19 and just my training was just coaching um, for money obviously and yeah Almost my entire adult life, I've been coaching in some way or the other. So even when I went to Sweden, played in Sweden or Germany and played a bit there, I was still, I was still coaching. Um, they sort of picked up on the fact that I was a coach and used me to coach juniors within clubs that I was at. So I've always always been coaching in my adult life as well as playing. And it definitely uh, sort of impacted my playing performance. I, I I maybe could have reached a higher ranking or whatever, but I didn't mind. I really enjoyed coaching, so it wasn't a big deal for me. Sometimes I enjoyed playing more. Sometimes I enjoyed coaching more. It just depends on where I was at. So it's certainly not a complaint, but there was more money. To answer your question, there was more money in coaching than playing, that's for sure. Yeah, that's the problem for a lot of people. Yeah. Would you say that the coaching had a negative effect on your on your kind of elite level playing and performance? Oh, definitely. As I said, I stopped training at the age of 19 when I was 200 and whatever in the world. Or So, you know, that that's sort of when you're in the box seat to train hard, improve your world ranking, hopefully move up to the top 100 like William Hensel achieved. And I never took a shot at that. I was always coaching. And I, I was still playing for Australia at, you know, world championships or Commonwealth championships and Commonwealth games and so on. But my day job was was coaching. Okay, so so you reckon that's that's really you had to make a choice between do you want to go for it as a player and just focus on that, or have kind of a more secure life and income combining the playing and the coaching, and, and you chose the the coaching option. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was more immediate than that. I mean, you need money to survive. So, <laughs> like, I, even if I took a shot at becoming a top international player, which was there was no guarantee of I, I didn't necessarily have the money to, to pay the bills next week so um coaching coaching was a necessity and as i said i enjoyed i always enjoyed coaching so it's certainly not a complaint but it's something i more or less had to do to get through my playing level wasn't really high enough to to make a living uh playing in europe yeah okay now what you're kind of famed for in, in the table tennis world alongside your crazy videos is, is your services, Brett. You're kind of, you're well known as having really dangerous serves. How did that, how did that develop in you as a player? I think then to an extent I was obsessed with serving from a young age. Like around the age of 15 or 16, I started just grabbing a bucket of balls and practicing my serves and I'd go home and I, I didn't have a table so I'd serve along the floor and try and bend the ball around corners. I think that you know had a really big impact on my my serving. And then when I was 18 or 19, I went to China for a month and served every day with Chinese players, really good Chinese players. Watched what they were doing and you know learned some technique there. And I've always just been extremely interested in the mechanics of it. So it allowed me to put in uh, a lot of hours on the table without getting bored. Yeah. So, yeah, a combination of understanding the techniques from a fairly young age and maybe having some talent for it and just just enjoying working on it. Now, one thing you mentioned there is maybe having like a talent for serving. What are your thoughts on that? Because it does seem that some people just seem to get serving more than others. But then, you know, at the same time, you, you've mentioned how much practice and stuff you put into it. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on are people talented for being good at serves, kind of, and what would that entail? 
it's complicated, isn't it? Yeah. If you read uh, Matt Side's book, Bounce, you'll you'll see that his take on it is people aren't really talented, it's just what you practice. And, you know, that's true to a large extent. And I think what you enjoy, you get good at. Like, if you if you hate backhands and you only want to play forehand, I just don't think you're going to have a great backhand. And I think it's the same with serving. If you if you don't really like practicing your serving, but you, you like practicing your top spin or whatever it is you like doing, I just think that, you know, eventually you'll look up and you'll have very ordinary serves. So, you know, are we talking about talent for serving? Are we talking about enjoyment for serving? I think I think they go hand in hand. Okay. So you, you need to enjoy it to put in the hours necessary to become good at it. And just to think about it, like you're walking around sort of thinking, oh, this is how the serve should feel, or you're walking around thinking about your backhand or, or maybe something that doesn't have anything to do with table tennis, like, you know, how much money you're going to make in your business life or whatever. But I think... You know that little bit of obsession um, can go a long way. Because it seems like a lot of people don't enjoy practicing their serve. It kind of feels a bit like a chore, something that they know that they should be doing, but they kind of never get round to because they're they're busy working on other things. True, isn't it? Like for you, you you just that was just something that you enjoyed, or did you do it because you thought it was important? No, I just enjoyed it. Like I knew it was important. I, I you know I don't think I don't think the motivations like can be separated, but I, I, de- I definitely enjoyed doing it. I wasn't thinking, like, I hate this, but I'm going to start serving a few people off if I, if I get another thousand hours up or something. I was yeah. I, I actually, like, getting out on the table and just trying to get it right and trying to get more spin and trying to position it and, and so on. And I think when people don't like serving, there's reasons for that as well. I mean, you can, you can definitely do some things that will enhance your enjoyment, I believe, anyway. Okay, but like, what what kind of things would you suggest? I would say definitely uh, putting small targets on the other side of the table, and you know, well placed targets, and you know, trying to hit them, or measuring the amount of spin that you're putting on the ball, finding ways to actually measure that. Like, you know, in my videos, I, I talk about getting off the table, serving on the floor, and trying to make the ball come back. And hitting the ball out further and further and trying to make the ball come back from, you know, over distances seven to ten meters sort of thing. I think if you have measurable feedback, it becomes more enjoyable rather than just you serving over and over again. And really, you don't know how much spin you're getting on the ball or is my serve improving. Without feedback, you probably don't improve too much. Okay, so you think the secret is to, yeah, to find a way to get feedback or to make it kind of into into almost a bit of a competition make it a bit more interesting exactly exactly cool now you've got loads of different service videos it'd be good to talk through a few of them but <laughs> firstly i just wanted to know what's your what's your favorite serve that you do well when i when i played i i did a lot of backspin and no spin serves okay and th- this was the chinese influence and you know going to china and you know, spending those hours with Chinese players who had a big bucket of balls and would stand there for a couple of hours a day and serve. They were, they were serving a lot of backspin and nose spin at the time. So I guess it's a serve that I got uh, fairly good at fairly young and won a lot of points off it. But I was so into it that I would also practice, you know, when the reverse serve come around, I was a very early adopter in the late 80s, which, you know, there was almost nobody doing it then. Um, I, I, I would... I'd like to try everything that came around, and then I'd go through little stages of, you know, just doing that. Is that almost like a technique to help you develop it, is then to really focus on just doing one thing? Yeah, I guess when something new come along, I'd think, well, maybe this is better, and then I'd just start doing it over and over again and start doing it in matches. But then if I got a little bit bored of that, I'd go back to doing other things that I thought I was quite good at that might win points against different players and so on. So, yeah, I, I, I sort of caught on to trends pretty early if I saw someone do something that I really like. So you talk about the reverse serve, yeah. which is something that for a lot of players is like a really tricky serve to master. Sure. It seems like in, in England and the UK, it was only about 10 years ago that you kind of started to see anyone doing that. I think it was quite late to come over and now all the juniors are doing it. But if you look at if you look at players like Gavin Rumgay or or players in Britain from his era, they generally don't have that serve just because they 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 weren't exposed to it at a, at a young age. You say that you kind of caught onto that quite early on. Yeah. One one Australian player 
uh, was training in Sweden. He come he came back from Sweden in 1989. So I'm going, I'm going back a long way here, and he had a very sort of primitive version of the reverse serve, and I I sort of took it and run with it and developed a fairly good reverse serve by the early 90s before most players um, were serving serving reverse serves. So I had some um, results with that fairly early on. I'm not sure that was ever my best serve, but it was just something different that people hadn't seen a lot of. So you can have you can have good results just by being that little bit different. Mm. Yeah. Now, it, for me personally, I mean, how many years have I been? I must have been playing table tennis for about 15 years. In matches still now, I I would never do a reverse serve. I you know sometimes I'll do it in practice, but yeah. I've never really put enough work into it to be comfortable doing it in matches. Yeah. Do you think that that's something that I should I should spend some time working on, or or do you think that you know you, you can you can play at a decent level without a reverse serve? What what do you think? I think if if you want to play at you know, well, it depends what you call a decent level, but if you want to play at a high level, you need a serve that goes away. If you're a right-hander, you need a serve that drifts away from a right-handed forehand. It's a really hard ball to return for a right-hander when the ball's short and moving away from you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think, you know, you might serve backhand short to the right-handed forehand, which has the same effect, but it's probably not as deceptive because people can read that much easier. So I think it's good to have a serve that actually goes away from the right-handed forehand, short to the forehand at a high level. It's something William Hensel did extremely uh, extremely well. He, he sort of had this half tomahawk, half punch type serve that always went away from the right-handed forehand. And it really troubled people. They couldn't use their reverse banana flick. That you know They couldn't just step around and push it with their backhand. So they were forced. They were tested on their short return on their forehand or their forehand flick. And it's amazing how many people are weak in that spot. Yeah, so people have got used to returning one type of side spin. Yeah. You're saying if you're then able to do the other type, you can. Their their shot that works so well against you know your standard pendulum serve can can their return all of a sudden is a lot weaker. Yeah, look at a player like Timo Boll. He he serves a regular pendulum serve with you know obviously it has variations on it, but it looks fairly simple. Then he has a reverse serve. And depending on who he's playing or how his opponent's going, he'll just serve either one of those. And it's incredibly effective, especially if players haven't seen a left-handed reverse that often. He'll just serve it all the time, or if they're picking up on that, he'll just go back to his pendulum. So he, he's spinning the ball off both ways, and that, that's, you know, that's effective because then you've got options. Mm. Okay, so when it comes to kind of mastering this reverse serve, what are some of the key things? Because I've tried it at different points and, you know, I, I can do it in practice. I'm just not confident enough to use it in a match. But how would you go about teaching the mechanics of it? Is it all about the wrist? Is it about the position of the arm? What's important? I think all of that, you know, I've made some videos sort of throwing a frisbee and just showing the way the wrist works. I was sort of doing some reverse frisbee throws. Um it's definitely about getting your elbow out and getting the bat further around than, than you think. It, uh, just when you're lining up the ball, like a lot of people start in their regular pendulum position and think, oh, okay, after I throw it up, I'm going to get around the side and do a reverse. But you don't, you don't really have that time. And then they end up just sort of pushing at the ball or, or getting no spin and you know, then reverting back to using their pendulum serve again. And from what you said, if you've got a reverse serve but you can't sort of use it in a game, you just have to commit to doing it, especially in practice. Yeah. you just got to say, I'm going to play for a week and I'm just going to keep serving reverse serves. I don't even care what happens uh, in these matches because it's almost – it's very difficult if you just serve, say, seven pendulum serves in a tight match and then you think, okay, now I'm going to pull out the reverse. It's just not there. Yeah. It's just not there. You just can't recall that serve you know, at the right, at the, in those moments. But if you're doing it often, it's just so much easier to recall it. So I'd, I'd definitely say if you're working on a serve, just start doing it. Don't, don't hold it back and think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I can, you know, I'll wait till I can get a thousand on in a row in practice and then I'll pull it out in the match. I think it's about doing it in a match fairly early on if you've got, you know, a reasonable action and you're getting reasonable skin. And when it comes to kind of getting yourself down into position and setting up for this serve, are you saying that you're starting in a different position for the reverse serve than you would for a standard pendulum? Oh, in, in a major way. So your elbow needs to be well out to the side. The, the, the head of your 
racket almost needs to be pointing back in at your stomach. Now, yeah. That's how far around I would say that you need to start, uh, at least when you start, that's what you need to be doing. You need to be you know, pointing the head of the racket at your stomach and just moving your wrist backwards and forwards quickly rather than starting sort of in some pendulum type position and then trying to rush it at the last moment. So yeah, absolutely. All the way around. So that means that the opponent pretty much knows that a reverse serve is coming, Definitely. don't they? Definitely. So it's so it's not about trying to to kind of deceive them at the last minute. No. It's just about using a different serve. Yeah. You you don't necessarily have to you know, you can deceive them at the last minute by either putting uh, backspin, side spin, or top spin and side spin on it, and then it's still very hard to read. But it's okay if they know the pendulum serves coming. Absolutely, and I think I think what you're getting at here is, you know, if the player knows, then it sort of loses its effect. But I I totally disagree. Like I think that, you know, this is what causes people to have a poor reverse pendulum serve when they think that, you know, it needs to be a surprise. I don't think it's yeah. a surprise. Uh, some of the good Russian players over the years, uh, Kuzman comes to mind and, and, and some others, like they just stand in that position and you know it's coming, but it's just, it comes in like a hand grenade. So there's not much you can do about it, even if you know it's coming. It's a, it's so spinny and so um, deceptive that it, it doesn't really matter if you knew it was coming or not. Okay, so I think potentially what I've been doing a bit all these years is trying to start all my serves in a very similar position so yeah. that, you know, when I'm down with the ball in my hand, my opponent hasn't got a clue what serves coming. And then I'm trying to do like a really complicated reverse serve, right. but I'm not, I'm not helping myself by starting in that, that kind of standard position. I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I, okay. I, well, maybe that's something, that's something that I can just start to, to practice yeah. is just not worrying about trying to confuse them and just concentrating on serve. Yeah. Have a look at a player like Marcus Freitas or someone like that, you know, and ask yourself at what stage did you know he was going to serve that reverse serve? Well, I was watching um, um, Jens Lundqvist play against Jung Jika the other day in the Swedish Open. I mean, he just served a reverse serve, and it was obvious he was going to serve a reverse serve every serve for the match. Okay. And he was serving it short to Chinese forehand, and you know, he won the match. I mean, I knew he was going to serve a reverse serve almost every serve for the whole game, but and so, so did Jung Jika, but it was still too good in the end. So I, I, what I'm saying is don't be afraid. Just just get around there and make sure, sure you serve it well rather than, you know, surprise the person with it. More about the quality of the serve than trying to, to yeah, surprise them. Yeah, absolutely. The quality of the serve is crucial. Cool. So um, were you one of those players that, you know, when, you're, when you were playing at your best that other players kind of refer to you as, Oh, all he, all he's got is serves. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? Oh, There's kind of absolutely. where they they kind of talk down about your ability because your your serves are really strong, and maybe the rest of your game isn't as strong as them, but you're still beating them. Oh, absolutely. I remember uh, one in juniors, one kid that you know he he doesn't even play anymore, and I'm going back like you know twenty something years here. I still remember a kid saying to me, like, imagine if you actually had a forehand and not just a serve. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I mean that sort of stuck with me. The guy with the serves that you know, if you if you can get past that, you should be right. You know. Because I've always found that you know I almost look at it at the other way around. Like if you've got people, because there are a few players in England that people say, oh, they're not any good. All they've got is they, you know, all they've got is some good serves. But really, if that's that that's got to be such a compliment <laughs> because that's basically saying that. Well, you should be at this level, but because you've put some work into your serves, you're actually at a much higher level than you would be at otherwise. Well, it's an important part of the game. It's it's a really important part of the game. Serving and returning are definitely the two most important parts of the game. And I think people don't realise just how well the Chinese receive, especially. It's never really discussed the fact that they re- just their receiver serve is amazingly strong, and their serves are strong as well. And that's where they're winning a lot of points. You, you watch the highlights and you see the, the big topspin, topspin rallies and the round the nets and you think that's how they play. But really, for a long time, they've been serving and returning people off, okay. you know, starting with the Europeans lately. So it's way underrated serving and returning, that's for sure. Cool. Well, what I'd like to do kind of as we, as we close is talk a little bit about 
about TT Edge, the system, how it works, kind of who the typical the typical member is and, and what they get as part of the package. Because I know you've got the videos on YouTube, but the whole TT Edge system is kind of closed off in, in the back end of the website, yeah, isn't sure, it? Sure. So TT Edge is a membership-based um, site. And basically, there's, I can't even think, there must be getting close to 300 instructional videos on the site by myself and William Hensel. Lots of series is about, you know, how to how to learn all the different serves in table tennis by myself, both myself and William. Um, both of us go through a lot of the basic shots and some more advanced shots and so on. What I try to do though is I try to encourage members to actually tape their or video their own play and send me through links to that video, and I'll send them back emails with you know. Um, and people don't see this because it's all sort of done privately, but I'll email them back some ideas or I'll you know pause their video and show them what they're doing at different times and give them some things to work on. So there's that aspect as well. And it's, that aspect is definitely underutilized. People are quite shy. Like you say, you know, send me through video. They'll, they'll say, I'm having a problem with my forehand. You say, send me through the video and then they disappear. But okay. a lot of people take advantage of it as well. And I think they're the people who get the most benefit from, from TT Edge now. R- apart from the library that exists and, you know, reasonably constant updates to the to the library with new videos, the people who get the most benefit are definitely people who send me video of their serve or their forehand or backhand, whatever it may be, and I give them feedback. Yeah, so instead of it just being them watching and trying to copy, you're actually able to tweak what they're doing if they're, if they're happy to send in video. Absolutely, yes. So is that something that that you offer just as part of the member- membership? There's no extra cost for There's that? no extra cost for that. It's not something that's sort of advertised, but every time somebody contacts me, that's exactly what I say. I say, send me through the video, and they, they, often they'll say, I don't expect a free service or whatever, and I say, no, it's actually part of the service. You can, you, you can feel free to send me through your video footage. So, yeah, I mean, maybe I should advertise it more, but for members who might be listening, send me through video. To me, that sounds like a really brilliant service because then it becomes more like they're actually working with you one on one as a coach instead of just, you know, learning through your through your videos and then kind of being left to sort it out on their own. Yeah, I think it's the future of online training. I, I think it needs to be more interactive. I mean, occasionally I'll set up a webcam or someone will set up a webcam in their in their shed or wherever they're playing in their basement, and I'll I'll actually sit there and say, okay, play some forehands now and like try and tweak their game. It's not perfect because the internet's still not, you know, as good as live footage, but it's pretty good. I mean, I did a couple of hours of that this morning with, with members. So occasionally I'll do that. Obviously I've got limited time, so I can't do that with, you know, potentially hundreds of people, but I, I would definitely be prepared to do it with some people depending, depending yeah. on the circumstances. But I definitely, I'll, I definitely watch, you know, watch video they send me through, just a couple of minutes of backhands and forehands and, you know, draw stuff, take some snapshots, draw stuff on the screen and say this is what you need to be doing and so on. Sounds brilliant. Now, one guy that I've worked with a little bit and um, and I know that you've produced some videos with is Andy Couchman. Sure. So how's that going? How's... um? He's, um, I've mentioned him in the podcast before. He is a guy from the UK who's trying to get himself a top 600 Eng- England ranking in three years, starting as a complete beginner. I think he's about six months into it now. And you've produced some videos looking at some of his strokes. What kind of things have you been helping him with? Because I think he's a really good example of your, your typical adult beginner. Well- Andy caught my interest. I actually approached Andy because I knew that he was doing a three-year challenge where he wanted to eventually get a UK ranking. And, you know, it's not unlike your your series from uh, last year. You know, the um, Expert in the Year series. So I was. Yeah, we call we called it like a more realistic version of Expert in the Year. <laughs> right. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. So I contacted him and said, "Look, you know, you're a member." Um, Start sending me through video. If, if you're happy, I'll, I'll make some public videos with footage of yourself so you can learn from the feedback, plus other members can learn from the feedback. And that's another aspect of TT Edge. I like, I like it when people say you can use the footage so I can make a video that not only that person watches, but potentially thousands or tens of thousands can watch over the years and learn from as well. Now, 
as I said, people are quite shy. Like they they will send you a video and say, this is just private, just between us. Can you show me X, Y, Z? And that's fine. But Andy's sort of one of those guys who says, yeah, if other people can learn from my from my journey, then even better. So I made uh, maybe two or three videos with him. It's fallen off a little bit. I was just in um, Egypt for the World Cadet Challenge without internet access and looking after children and so on. But um, we'll get back into that really soon. So do you do you see in Andy kind of when you look at these players the the things that they need help with are often quite similar between different players so that's why if you make a video showing Andy what he needs to do with his forehand there's probably going to be loads of other TT Edge members that are that are making the same mistake and able to to learn from your feedback to Andy. Well that's the idea. I mean I hope that's the way it works. I mean it's it's not really proven. Online training is very new as you know. Um but I hope it works that way. I hope people can relate to his journey and the common mistakes that he's making. And, you know, they might be playing their forehand in a similar way or similar way to others who are being analyzed and say, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm doing that as well. Um, I can learn from this video, even though it's not about them. So, yeah, the answer is yes. So I'll test your memory. What, what are some of the things that you, that you think you can see in Andy that he could do with improving? I, I, def, I mean, definitely, we've talked a little bit about serve, you and I, but definitely his serve. It looks um, it looks like he's just started out with his serve, which he has, and he, his whole sort of structure collapses as he's serving. He needs to keep it. If he's just gonna, even on his regular pendulum serve, he's going to have to keep his elbow up and learn to use his wrist and forearm. At the moment, he just puts his elbow up at the start, uses his upper arm and pushes forward and ends up basically just hitting the ball rather than spinning the ball. So that will be one thing that... Over time, I will I will look to help him with online. Um, his backhand, he sort of just holds his thumb up in the middle of the the rubber and sort of just pushes out and uses his upper arm again and just lets it rock backwards and forwards rather than putting his elbow out to the side using his wrist and forearm and playing consistently in that way. His forehand's developed, uh, looks good. His forehand tops him, but when I see him play in a game, he just doesn't he just doesn't use it. He just basically hits. So as I said, this is just, I've just started with Andy. This is part of his three-year journey so hopefully I can have an impact there but um, certainly I don't feel like I've had a major impact thus far. Yeah but he's definitely going to keep going for the long term so I'm sure we'll see some big improvements well, in, in his game. Well let's see I mean it's easy to say you're going to play for three years but you have you have to walk the walk so he seems really motivated and you know there's no sign that he's not going to to continue. He does have some physical restrictions as you know which was another reason why I was interested. He has spondylitis which is an inflammatory uh, condition hereditary and I know a little bit about that so I was sort of interested to work with someone who's also got some, um, some restrictions there as well yeah see if you can overcome it yeah now one question one question I wanted to ask you was has has there been any big success stories through the TT Edge system I know you say that all this kind of online coaching is quite new but have you seen any players that have kind of learned predominantly through the online coaching and have actually gone on to, to really improve and see some big jumps in, in their level. I've seen people send me through video, and I'm not going to name them, who play with very nice technique after after watching the videos and, and some conversations and so on. I've seen, like, as far as massive improvements uh, with results, um, one player in the U.S. has moved, he's, you know, he's quite a notorious um, person on on different forums and so on. He, he's moved his rating up quite nicely and I've worked with him quite a lot over, over the last year, but I certainly don't take full responsibility for his table tennis. He's, he's done a lot of other things and he's also, you know, he's the one going down there training every night. So, you know, I'm not taking responsibility for other people's results. But yeah, definitely seen some improvements in people's strokes. You know, how much that sort of converted into real results in tournament play, I'm not always sure of, but... Um, yeah, well, hopefully we'll find out more down the track as time goes on. Yeah, so I guess technique in particular is is probably the easiest to to get across and and see the changes through the through the use of video. Yeah, online, online training has huge challenges. You know, you can show people how to hit a backhand and forehand, but what what from there? How how do they you know implement that into their game? How do they you know take that from from their basement? and apply that at tournaments and so on. And how can you be a part of that? How can you help people to 
you know, take that step and put it into match play and, and, and so on. These, these are huge challenges, and I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say I have all the answers. They're things I think about all the time and you know, things I'll be working on over the next few years, but I don't profess to have every answer to online training at this stage. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's an exciting time because obviously as technology improves and more people have got access to good video, it means that you don't have to find yourself within a 10 mile radius of a really brilliant club in order to get access to top coaching and, and technical instruction. Yeah, that's true. And as time, as time goes on and the internet speeds up, I mean, you can, you can position a camera in people's basements and, and be effective uh, whilst they're playing against a robot or a training partner. I think it's always going to be better to do one-on-one training in a hall, but that's expensive. That costs, you know, I don't know what, what it costs in the, in the UK, maybe it costs 30 quid now, whatever it costs, right? That's expensive, yeah. whereas online can be cheaper for obvious reasons. Um, and you can have a 10-minute session with somebody rather than an hour. Mm. You know, if, you, if it's one-on-one down the hall, you, you can't just go for 10 minutes. That would be ridiculous, right? But if someone says, I'm struggling with my forehand, I'll say, have you got a webcam? Show me. That sounds like that's really going to be the way forward for a lot of people once you're able to, to really get a system that works. Yeah. And, you know, that doesn't cost them anything. Uh, it's all part of the, the membership stuff. It's all part of the membership stuff. So, you know, I may not want to sit there, for, as I said, for, for hundreds of people for an hour or a day or whatever, because I just don't have the time. It's just the, the mass is clear. But... You know, if people come and say, like, I'm struggling with my backhand or whatever, five or ten minutes, you can sort of put them on a different track and say, come back to me in a week or two when you've practiced that, and I'll have another look at it. Or just next time, just shoot me through video, and I'll see whether you've improved or not. Yeah, because you don't need to be there as the coach all the time. You just need to have a look, give them some suggestions, send them away, and then when they come back, see have they made the improvements. Yeah. Exactly. The reality of one-on-one coaching is a lot of people who are one-on-one coaches are actually just trainers. They don't, they don't speak a lot or they don't have many original thoughts or ideas about technique. And that's fine. I mean, they're training partners. Yeah. Coach slash training partner. And there's different degrees of that. I mean, some people are like 50% coach, 50% training partner. But I've actually seen people be 100% training partner and still call themselves a coach, but not a word gets said during the whole session. There's definitely a place for that as well. So that that's, you know, with online training, you can't, you can't stand there and block balls to people. So you're 100% a coach. So you need to be fairly good at what you do. Yeah, definitely. You can't, you, you can't be clueless if you're just coaching online. It, it actually no. is the greatest or, you, or you, you could, but you'd be exposed very quickly. Oh, you'd be exposed extremely quickly, Where, whereas a training partner doesn't get exposed as quickly because they're, they're providing a quality service, even though the name of the session may be marginally wrong, they're still providing a quality service to the, to the client, money's paid. It's all fine. That, that, that's fine. I've done that before. I've trained people and, and so on. I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. It's a good thing. But online has a totally different uh, you know, take on coaching for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, we've reached the point of the interview where I asked the guest to, to share a top tip. Now, I, I realize that I haven't prepped you for this, so um, uh, apologies for that. Have you, have you got a top tip to mind, something that you think is really important and practical that you can, that you can share with the listeners? If not, we can always cut for five minutes and you can have a think. A top tip. I would say learn to use your wrist and forearm correctly when you play. And uh, you, you, you just got to get on my YouTube channel. You get on my YouTube channel. <laughs> that's, that's my top tip. I think you kind of talk about the whip of the forearm and the wrist, don't you? I talk a lot about that. I talk a lot about the coordination of the backswing and stroke, which isn't discussed very much, and how that all works. I mean, there's other ways serves can work and top swings can work and so on. But I just try and give people a little bit of a map there to put them on a track that can work well in the future for them. So... I would say I would, my top tip is get your technique right and, and especially work out what's actually going on. Elbow position, wrist and forearm. Because that's kind of the fundamentals of a lot of different strokes and serves. Yeah, absolutely. Like your elbow position, like you can see with the Chinese, they've got their elbow way out to the side these days. They've, they've 
really develop their backhands uh, by you know not having the elbow stuck on their right hip, but having you know, way out to the side and, and so on. So yeah, elbow position is is crucial as well. Now, now, just briefly talking about that, one thing that I've noticed when I've been coaching different beginners is that some people can naturally or or whatever they're able to throw a ball, throw a frisbee, kind of like whip a towel, all, all of these different strange actions and emotions that they somehow picked up other people just for whatever reason aren't able to do that they don't really have the the correct technique for throwing a ball they're, yep. they're they've never really done frisbee and what i find is that the ones that can naturally throw a ball you know 100 yards and make it look easy are the ones that are able to do a forehand topspin kind of a, and pick it up really quickly and the ones that can't do those other things they're not able to kind of like whip a towel because they're just kind of flapping it around okay. are the ones that then struggle with the serve and and it's because it's what you talk about this wrist and arm action and kind of getting that whip and kind of the the loose acceleration that that's kind of a something that's key in so many different sports and and techniques it, of course it is of course a couple of months ago i was in the cook islands you'll have to google it if you don't know where it is but i was in the cook islands and one boy from an island of 400 people i took him out the back and we threw some boomerangs just for fun i took some boomerangs over with me and he had a perfect technique for throwing a boomerang and you know it's no great surprise that he had perfect technique when he plays table tennis as well it's all sort of the same where the kids the kids who can't throw a boomerang which is very similar to throwing a stone or, or a tennis ball or whatever. The kids who can't do that just really struggle to learn, you know, good backhand and forehand service technique as well. So what you're saying is completely correct. It's all interconnected. And a lot of these skills are learned at a very young age where, where kids will play other sports and those uh, those lessons, those abilities are sort of transferred into table tennis as well. How, how to use your arm correctly, the throw a ball, play a topspin, whatever it is that you're doing. So you're 100% correct. Yeah. Or another one, actually, I just remembered is like skimming a pebble. Those sort of things. Exactly. You know, the kind of, yeah, like that's, it, it's something that, you know, it's it's just the technique. But once you've got that technique, that technique is exactly the same for, you know, getting the, the heavy backspin on a serve and stuff. It, 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 skimming a pebble is exactly the same technique as you want to be using for your backspin serve. There's there's almost no difference. It's the same. It's a it's also the same motion that you would use in baseball for, for you know, a round arm sort of, Field throw, I don't know what they call it in base, but they use exactly the same technique in cricket and outfield, you know, throw. Or yeah. Where they throw, throw around. It's the same technique. Your arm works in exactly the same way. So, and, and this this really seems to be why, you know, they talk about sporty kids and unsporty right. kids, coordinated kids and uncoordinated kids. And, you know, it's, it, it's no coincidence that the kid that's able to skim a pebble is also able to throw in cricket and they can also serve in table tennis and and you you show them the technique and they can do it instantly whereas the kid that doesn't know how to throw a ball no wonder they're not able to master the serve either correct a lot of those building blocks for you know these technical aspects you're talking about that they are put in place before the age of 12 so you know, after the age of 12, you tend to just be able to manipulate old skills, whereas before the age of 12, you can actually learn new skills. It's a bigger topic, obviously, and we might have not have time for that today. But, you know, that's why it's super important that kids play a variety of sports and do a, a variety of activities before the age of 12. So it actually helps. If you get a kid to play table tennis, it really helps if he's played soccer, cricket, whatever form of, you know, racket sport whether it be tennis or squash or whatever he, he's climbed trees he's thrown stones and skim pools and all all of that stuff adds up yeah so yeah unfortunately a lot of those kids might go on and continue to play football or soccer and you might not get them to play table tennis because they they're gifted net well not gifted but they've got the skills to to move forward in other sports but they're the type of kids you want you don't want them to have to learn new skills after the age of 12 or 13 you want them to have those skills uh, before the age of 12. Sure. Well, it's been fantastic talking to you, Brett. This is the kind of stuff that I really like thinking about and discussing. And, you know, it's, it, there aren't loads of coaches that are into this. There's lots of coaches that, that really like kind of all the table tennis stuff. But, you know, the whole 
thinking a bit more outside the box and, and getting a bit bigger is is what I love talking about. So yeah. thanks for joining me on the show. It's It's been fantastic. I really appreciate uh, you having me on and um, good luck with your coaching. Cheers. Thank you. Now, finally, if um if there are people listening that would like to reach out to you, ask you a question, maybe thinking about joining TT Edge, have you got um, kind of a social media account or, or an email address that's best for you? Uh, they could contact me at brett, B-R-E-T-T, at ttedge.com. I don't really have a Facebook. Well, we have TT Edge has a Facebook um, page, which is TT, Table Tennis Edge or TT Edge. Okay, so so email or email is probably best, brett at ttedge.com. Sure. Great. Okay, cheers for joining me, Brett. It's been brilliant talking to you. Thanks. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, cheers. See you later. Bye. Bye. A big thank you goes out to Brett for joining me on this episode of the podcast. Really great information there. Loads of tips that I'm sure are going to help you improve your serves, and that should have a big impact on your general level in table tennis. For me, there was one tip that really stood out there that, you know, for my game is important and I'm sure is going to be useful for a lot of you guys as well. And that's the idea of not trying to deceive your opponent in terms of what serves coming, but instead focusing on using the spin for the deception. So what I mean by that is, you know, when I when I've been doing my reverse serve, I've always been trying to have it look at the start when the ball's in my hand as if I'm going to do a pendulum serve and then at the last minute I do a reverse and I kind of do the same thing when I'm doing like a tomahawk serve I I try and make it look like I'm doing a pendulum serve and then I try and surprise them by throwing in the tomahawk and what that does is one it makes the the serve a lot harder to do because you're not starting in the correct position and two it just means that it's more difficult to get a really good high quality serve with good spin like if I'm doing a tomahawk serve and and I've got to as the ball's in the air get into position it just means that I'm not able to get as much spin on the ball and the reverse it's just you know trying to do that's just completely thrown me off so I really like what Brett said about deceive with your spin and it doesn't matter if they know what serves coming even even some of the top players you can tell a mile off what serves going to come but it's the fact that the serve is just so high quality and they can vary the spin they're doing with that serve. You know, that's what's important. So that's the big lesson I've took away from from this chat with Brett. And I'm going to be using that in my own games from now on. I'm going to start trying to use this reverse serve. I'm not going to worry about trying to make it look like I'm doing a pendulum. I'm just going to concentrate on, on doing a really high quality reverse serve. Thanks for listening to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, please head over to the iTunes page and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so already. You can also leave us a honest review on there. I'd really appreciate that. If you can continue to share these episodes on Facebook and Twitter with your friends, that would be really appreciated. The show is continuing to gain in popularity. Recently, we've been seeing kind of 200 views every single day, which is brilliant. That's all thanks to the efforts of you guys sharing the show. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show today. I'll see you next week.